thank you everyone for um for getting online um with us tonight we're really glad that you could join us this is the third year that ohio state extension and the kathy do you want to go by riverside natural area or do you want to go by hamilton conservation corps <laughs> Hamilton Conservation Corps. Gotcha. And then Butler Soil and Water. It's the third year that we've done a series. So the first one was on um, pollinators. Last year we did a lot on birds. And this year it's kind of more wildlife in general. So we're starting our session tonight with Angela from Frenald, um, who's going to be talking about some of the, the comeback of wildlife. So I'm really excited about this. Um, so I'm just going to pass it over to Angela and let her take it away. Fabulous. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. I'm glad to be here. Nice to see everybody uh, that I can see in the in the uh, top bar and for the rest of our 30 participants. Hello. <laughs> My name is Angela Marzi and I am an interpretive uh, naturalist and histor historian at the Fernal Preserve site just north of Ohio. We're just outside of Ross, Ohio. And uh, tonight I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the um, wildlife of Fernald. Specifically, I'm going to concentrate on some of the most visible critters that we have out on the site. And those are primarily going to be the mammals. I might talk a little bit about the birds because I'm a naturalist and I get excited and want to talk about everything. So I do have a PowerPoint to show you. We're going to talk a little to do a little intro on the history of the site for those of you who maybe have not been out to Fernald or maybe have not heard that much about the site. And then we'll go straight on into the wildlife. Um, as we go along, if anybody has questions that get uh, gets put in the chat, please just uh, give me a little, a little vocal cue and I will be happy to pause and listen to that question. Because once I get started, I lose my visual on everybody and all I see is just my PowerPoint presentation. So feel free to break in with, with those questions. So is everybody ready to get started? Yeah. All right, fantastic. I am going to go ahead and share and then my face will go away and you'll get to see all kinds of beautiful wildlife instead. So let me go ahead and get my uh, PowerPoint up here. And Lynn, if you'll just let me know when I'm sharing. That's it. Oh, and if anyone okay. is unmuted, um, you might want to mute yourself. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off now so that mine will, my PowerPoint will function perfectly. Uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Lynn, if you'll let me know when I'm in slideshow mode. Good to go. Fantastic. And if for some reason something is not playing properly, please let me know and I will be happy to um, catch up or pull out and go back in. All right, here we go. Well, thank you everybody for joining me here tonight. Um, what I'll do is I'll do a little oversight of the Fernald Preserve site history and then we'll go straight on into the wildlife. So uh, I like to call this a changing landscape, Fernald Preserve. And the photos that you see are four different aerial photographs of the same geographic location. They're just taken in four different periods of time. So very quickly, we'll take a look at uh, what Fernald used to look like in the past versus what it does now. Our first picture in the upper left is taken about 1938. And if you look at it, it basically looks like a patchwork quilt. And that's what it is. The site that we now know as Fernald Preserve has about 150 years of agricultural use history uh, under its belt before it was made into an industrial site and then uh, cleaned up, remediated, and became the wildlife preserve that it is today. So back in 1938, if you were to get up in an airplane and take a look at the site, you would see exactly what you see here, a patchwork of farm fields and pastures, farm buildings, and of course the farmhouses. And there were 11 families that owned farm property on the uh, site, which is Fernald Preserve today. I like to tell uh, school children when I'm doing this, uh, show them this slide, that the 1938 photo was taken before color came into the world, because everybody knows that color came into the world when the film The Wizard of Oz was released and Dorothy goes through the door into Oz and everything bursts into Technicolor. I'm kidding, but I love to tell people that. <laughs> Our next picture, number two, is in the upper right. And this is from about 1992. Now I'll tell you a little bit more about the production history of the site in a moment. This picture was taken after the production and manufacturing activities had ceased on the site, but I like using it because all of 
of the buildings that were built on site, the manufacturing plants, as well as the support buildings. And this gray area right here was a huge staff parking lot at one point. All of the structures are still in place in 1992 with very few exceptions, but you can see big change from those farm fields that were back there in the late 30s. So in the lower left, our third picture <clears throat> is from 2002. You start to see some empty areas where the buildings have been torn down, but you start to see a few green areas where cleanup and remediation has begun. So we are early on in the process here, uh, just a few years into it. And then our final picture, number four, in the lower right, is taken from about 2009. And that looks very similar to what the Fernal Preserve site looks like today. Very green, a lot of uh, ponds, a lot of wetlands, open areas, and there's really only two major buildings on the site today. One is the water treatment uh, plant, which is still on site, which is cleaning up and remediating the groundwater in the aquifer beneath the site. And the other is, of course, the visitor center. Other than that, we have a wonderful site, which is 1,050 acres of ha wildlife habitat land. So what did we do here? Well, <clears throat> back during the Cold War, at the end of World War, World War II, everyone knows about the uh, atomic bombs that were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So after hostilities ceased at the end of World War II, the Cold War era began to set in. And the United States government was very concerned that there was a possibility of hostilities breaking out again sometime in the near future. So they put into place a vast weapons manufacturing complex throughout the United States. Now, if you look at the map here, you'll see the outline of Ohio right here. And the center point that all these rays are extending out from, that indicates the Fernald site. These other dots located around the country indicate other sites that were part of this weapons complex. So it wasn't just for Fernald, they were close to 100 different sites throughout the country and you only see just a few of them right here. And they ranged from uh, nuclear reactor sites to other manufacturing sites like Fernald. Uh, out in the uh, desert southwest, you had uranium mines and all of the, those rays show either material flowing into the Fernald site for processing or flowing finished products out from the Fernald site to their next destination. And what Fernald's mission was, is it was a manufacturing site for uranium metal rods that were designed to be put into nuclear reactors, undergo fission so that uh, plutonium could be produced. And that was the end goal uh, for plutonium was to be used in the weapons that were going in the national uh, weapons stockpile. So Fernald was kind of the first step in that chain. The material that came into the site was either raw uranium ore, or it was re material recycled from other manufacturing processes that contained uranium. That raw material was brought into the site and through a series of manufacturing processes, un uh, heat chemical uh, reactions underwent transformation and it was a multi-step process to go from raw ore or recycled material to finished uranium metal feed rods. So Fernald was kind of a <clears throat> cross between a metals um, production site and a machine shop for tooling the finished rods before they were sent out. And those uranium rods you can see here, we have two technicians doing uh, quality control on there, making sure everything is as it's supposed to be. And like all manufacturing processes at the time, this was very complex. There were nine full-size manufacturing plants that took uranium from raw ore to the finished product before it was shipped out. There were also auxiliary buildings. There was a power plant located on site, coal-powered, coal-fired steam power plant that produced electricity. They had their own water plant. They had their own sewage treatment plant. So all of the utilities were located on site. They had a fire department. They had a, obviously, administration buildings. They had uh, a hospital and cafeterias and staff laundries and just a lot of different support buildings on there. And like all manufacturing processes, anything that's manufactured, whether it's a pocket calculator or a pair of sneakers or a school bus or uranium metal feed rods, production generates waste. And I believe our approximate uh, formula for that was for every pound of uranium that was produced, uranium metal produced on site, three pounds of waste were generated. 
and across the board with industries at this time. Production started in 1951 and went on until 1989. Um, for the first part of that manufacturing mission, just like in all industries at the time, there were very few to no environmental controls on that. So people weren't very careful in any manufacturing situation, really what they did with their waste. And of course, that had to be cleaned up once the production mission came to an end. So one thing that they had to do was go in and remove the actual physical structures on the site. So we have some uh, heavy equipment here taking down some of the plant buildings. You can still see in the background the water tower um, where water was pulled up from the aquifer and used to supply water, water for the site. So those structures had to come down. In some cases, some infrastructure had to be built in order to facilitate the taking down of other structures. And we see here a structure being put in place. We have a, a structure on site called the on-site disposal facility where some of the material uh, cleaned up from the site is stored today. So here this shows a couple of the workers on site prepping and putting, uh, helping put together this on-site disposal facility. And that was one of the structures that had to be built as the cleanup and remediation was taking place. So in 2006, cleanup went on from 1996 to 2006. The site was finally cleaned up and remediated. The only thing that is still ongoing is, of course, the groundwater cleanup. That's progressing as it should. It's about halfway uh, to where it should, uh, should be to be completely done. And it will probably be completed, our technicians are telling us, sometime in the late uh, 2020s or very early 2030s. It's a slow process, but it is uh, ongoing and going very well to date. So what do we have? Now we are Fernald Preserve, and this is the rock sign that is located out at our front entrance. If some of you have been to visit Fernald before, then this is a very uh, familiar site to you. If you've never been, I like to talk about our logo very quickly because it really encapsulates what the site is all about now. Now, while cleanup and remediation were going on, the company that was involved in doing that work was very proactive in talking to the local community about what not only the processes that were going on, uh, soliciting suggestions from the surrounding community about what was being done, how it should be done, the cost of what was being done, as well as what the end use of the site was going to be. So they asked the community, what do you want Fernald to be when we're finished cleaning, cleaning it up and remediating it? And the resounding majority of the community said, what we want is a, a park for wildlife. And that's what our mission is today. Fernald Preserve is an undeveloped park with an emphasis on wildlife and it's open to the public. So that means other than the visitor center and the water treatment plant, there are no other buildings really on site. We don't have a golf course. There's no campground. There are no tennis courts or basketball courts. It's not a recreation area. It's a wildlife area for people to come and walk and enjoy nature and observe the wildlife. And the logo that we have for the site here speaks to the three habitats that we have on site. The wavy lines right here indicate the restored Ohio prairie grasslands, which are the majority of, uh, most of the habitat on the site is restored native Ohio prairie grasslands. The leaf, which also is cleverly disguised as the wing of the bird, is standing in for our forest habitats. And then our little concentric rings here uh, stand for the wet, uh, wetland and open water habitats that we have on site. The bird is a belted kingfisher, which is a very common bird that you can see on site when you come out and visit. And I think it suits uh, the end purpose of Fernald very well. I think it's a very good logo for us to have. So what's here now? Well, there's that belted kingfisher. And I love this bird, especially because not only can you see it diving and perching over the open water and wetland areas on the site, but it's one of those birds that it's very easy to tell the males from the females. This is actually a female. And the reason we know that is because of this rusty red belt across her middle. Only the female belted kingfisher has that. The males would just have a solid white belly. So it's very easy to tell the girls from the boys. And the girls, unlike a lot of bird species, are more, uh, more beautiful than the guys are in this case. So I think that's, that's fair, definitely. So what's here on site now? You can see in this wonderful panorama, 
a lot of open water, a lot of green spaces. That little metal speck back there is the visitor center. That's the water treatment plant. And between those, other than a few telephone poles, you are seeing a lot of open wildlife habitat. So we have 395 acres of restored forest. Uh, some of that has been restored. Some of that was already uh, in place along the northern and western and southern borders of the, um, of the site. We have approximately 350 acres of restored Ohio native prairie. We have about 141 acres of wetland and open water habitat, about 33 acres of drier grassland savanna, and only 29 acres of infrastructure. So the site is 1,050 acres and less than 30 of that are man-made objects. And that's what I absolutely love about Fernal Preserve. Because we have these habitats and very little human encroachment and buildings and interference on the site, all of those habitats are open and the wildlife can mingle between them freely. And that provides excellent um, living opportunities and, and wildlife observation opportunities for humans, but living conditions for the wildlife. And we do have quite a diversity of that. So let's get into the meat and bones. Let's talk about who lives here. And I've decided to concentrate on the mammals because again, those are some of the most visible wildlife that we have on site. And they also are species that provide the most easily seen signs that they were there. And of course, I'm talking about tracks, I'm talking about finding hair, finding signs of uh, uh, feeding on browsing on vegetation or maybe finding signs of predation. And of course, naturalists always talk about scat droppings <laughs> because you can learn a lot about what animals live on a, uh, in a particular habitat by what they leave behind. And scat or droppings are something they leave behind that we can find. So who lives here? Well, Ohio has about 63, I believe, different species of what, what are called resident um, mammals that are found in Ohio year round. And out of those 63, Fernald has over 40. We're extremely proud of that. So we have great wildlife diversity out there now. We know that, again, because of signs that we find. Again, uh, hair, signs of predation or browsing on vegetation, scat, tracks, and evidence that we find videos on wildlife cameras. And I do have some wildlife video clips that I want to show you in PowerPoint tonight. I hope you enjoy seeing those. Um, we also see a few in person, but not as many as you would think. Sometimes the only way we know that an animal is there is if we see them on the wildlife uh, trail cameras. And that is always, going through the footage always makes for exciting viewing for the naturalists. So you have to have a habitat. So we're going to lace up our boots and go, to a, go through a virtual hike on all of our habitats that we have on site. And let's start out with one of my favorite mammals. I say that about all of them, but I really have a soft spot in my heart for this first one, and that is the American beaver. I would say arguably that they are, other than bird species, the most visible type of animal that we see or see signs of on site. And if you've ever been to Fernal Preserve, you know if you hike the Hickory Trail, you are going to see signs of beaver. You're either going to see beaver drag uh, paths across the trail, or you're going to see stumps of trees where they've taken trees down, or you're going to see beaver ponds or a beaver lodge or definitely beaver dams. And if you're very lucky, sometimes you'll get a glimpse of the beaver itself. So we feel very fortunate that we have such an active and visible beaver presence on site. So what are these guys? Well, believe it or not, they're actually rats. <laughs> They're in the order Rodentia. So they are in the same group of animals that rats, mice, squirrels, groundhogs, porcupines, um, prairie dogs, all of those animals are in. They are rodents. And a rodent has amazing teeth. The teeth of rodents grow throughout their entire life and that's what makes beavers and other rodents chewing champs. They are known for their ability to cut down trees and they do that not because they eat the tree, they're actually eating the uh, inner layer of bark where all the nutrients are and that's what they like to feed on. But they do use those down trees for the most part for building material for their lodges and their dams. But they're also predisposed instinctively, uh, genetically to chew. 
and chewing helps keep those teeth worn down to a manageable level. If beavers stopped chewing, their teeth would eventually grow so long that they would not be able to chew at all. It would impede their ability to eat or to, to cut down trees for, for building material. So being pre-programmed genetically and instinctively to chew helps keep their toolkit in top condition. Now, if you've ever seen a, a beaver with their mouth open, their front teeth are incisors on the top and bottom. The front surface of that are dark orange. Now, that's not because they drink a lot of coffee and it stained their teeth, but there is, the front layer of enamel on their teeth is very, very hard, and it has um, mineralized iron in it on that front surface, and it makes for a tougher, stronger enamel, and it also gives it that kind of rusty, uh, rusty red-brown color. The enamel on the back side of their teeth and then the rest of their teeth is, is similar to ours. And it's a little bit softer than that mineralized uh, layer on the front. And because of that, it wears down faster than the front layer does and it forms a perfect chisel point, which enables them to do their job. So simply by chewing and doing what comes natural to a beaver, that enables the beaver to keep their, their toolkit in top shape. And yes, like I said, they do like that inner layer of bark where all the nutrients are. That's where the good stuff is. They'll also eat leaves. They'll eat other aquatic plants. And from what I understand, beaver, beavers in captivity are really fond of apples. Go figure. So I have something in common with beavers because I'm a big apple fan too. So when I was out in mid-June last year on the site... I came across a cottonwood tree that beavers had taken down and they were working on stripping the branches off and working on uh, chewing the bark off of the main trunk of the tree. And as I went out to look at that tree trunk, I came across this beaver that just came out of a pond. You can't see it on the left hand side, but behind the bushes right here is a pond and the beaver cruised through a little canal and popped up about 25 feet behind me right in front of my car and decided it was going to cross the road. So I got some nice uh, footage of a beaver on land. Now they're very graceful in the water on land. Well, not so much. <laughs> you can see that paddle like tail. It's a very short clip, unfortunately, but um, what this beaver did is went right across in front of the car, ducked down on the other side of the, of the road there, and there was a little canal and path that it took there. Now about two minutes later, I started hearing chewing sounds. And I turned around and this same beaver was working on this cottonwood tree that was, oh, just under a foot in diameter. And I slowly crept up on, on her and was able to get some great footage of her chewing in action. So let's watch her do her thing for just a few minutes. I love watching them because she'll pause. And it almost like, looks like she was going into a little trance there for a minute. She's actually listening. You can't hear any video, any sound on this video, but a beaver chewing on a tree makes a lot of noise and they stop after a few seconds usually and listen because when they're chewing, it's impossible for anything for them to hear anything sneaking up on them. And I sat there and watched her for a good 10 minutes. What you don't see is me behind the camera having a silent freak out because I was about 10 feet away from her at this point and she could not have been bothered at all that I was there. I might as well have been invisible. She could care less. So it's really neat to be able to see these guys. And I think a baby beaver, which is called a kit, is arguably the cutest baby animal in the entire world. I know a lot of people think baby deer fawns are the cutest. I'm sorry, that is absolutely adorable. I love beaver kits. Now they uh, come by their behavior instinctively, but they will follow mom and dad around while they're working uh, and doing what they do in their ponds. So kind of like kids following their parents around, they will do that too. And some biologists think they may pick up a little behavior from mom and dad, but even beavers that have been raised in captivity, um, that have been orphaned and raised solo in captivity, will attempt to build dams with things they find in their habitats. So most of that behavior is instinctive, but they will follow their parents around. And I love this next clip. I love to call this take your kit to work day. It'll clear up in just a second, but this big white lump right here at the front is the adult beaver. And this smaller lump right here is the young beaver who's followed their, their parent 
up from the pond and this black area back here is the pond. They're about maybe 25, 30 feet up above uh, from the pond up the bank. So let's see if this beaver uh, kit will help uh, mom or dad with their work. There's mom or dad moving some stuff out of the way. Have a listen for predators. And then they go off and do their thing. And beaver kits, just like when you bring your child to work with you, are just about as helpful. <laughs> that beaver kit wound up going back into the water. Did not help at all. <laughs> One of the most other visible wildlife uh, species on site is, of course, the white-tailed deer. Just like in all the other areas of Cincinnati, they are everywhere. Um, it's hard to believe that this species was extirpated, uh, eradicated from the state back in 1900. It seems kind of hard to believe nowadays because they are everywhere. They've, they've come back and become not just a success story, but in some people's eyes, a nuisance uh, living in close quarters in sub suburban and urban areas. But they slowly began to filter back into the state of Ohio from surrounding states once the quality of the habitat began to improve. Uh, once the building uh, and clearing of land during, during the pioneer days and uh, the early part of the 20th century began to die down a little bit and more green spaces began to be replanted, that was conducive to white-tailed deer coming back into the area. And they have not only survived in close proximity to people, they have thrived. Deer are built to take in information. And as you can see from this picture, ears, eyes, and nose. They have incredible senses of smell. They have great eyesight, not the full color vision that we as humans have. They can see a little bit on the color spectrum, maybe some blues and greens and yellows. Um, but what they can pick up on is movement. And a deer being an herbivore, a prey animal, its eyes are located on the side of its head. So it has almost a 360 degree field of vision except directly behind its head. Its ears are large they're bowl shaped and they can move them in opposite directions. So you can actually have one ear facing forward, one ear facing back <clears throat> and hear an almost complete surround sound, so to speak. So they are built to take in information. I like to tell people uh, in my programs that if deer were human, they would either be the best research assistants that any college professor could ever have or they would be the best super spies on the planet because they are built for taking in and processing information. That is what they do best. And they are of course browsers. They will eat a little bit of everything from uh, nuts and berries. They'll eat uh, fungi and mushrooms, but they'll also eat the tender tips off of twigs. They'll eat leaves, the tips off green briars, just a little bit of everything. So they are, are very, very good and efficient browsers on a wide variety of species. That's one reason that even though they're such a large mammal, they're the largest mammal in the Cincinnati area, uh, an adult male can weigh in at over 300 pounds, a big one. That's one reason they are so successful, even though they're a large animal at living in close proximity to people is because everybody knows they like to browse on things we grow in our garden too. So <laughs> when we first moved into our neighborhood up here in Cincinnati, um, when we bought our house back in 2001, we gave up trying to grow hostas because basically we were planting a salad bar for the deer. And I just said, that's it. We're gonna put gravel down. I'm tired of buying, buying plants to establish in here again. So the deer can find lots of stuff to eat. They don't need me feeding them too. And of course we have a baby deer, which is called a fawn. This picture I love because this was taken by one of the other naturalists at Fernal Preserve. And this picture was taken in front of the glass windows at the front of the visitor center. So this was about six or seven years ago, I believe. The mother parked the baby there while, and hid the baby there while she went out to browse and get food. And it was just sitting right there in, in, the, in the shrubs right in front of the window. So uh, my supervisor was able to actually go out and take a picture of it. And of course that beautiful dappled coat mimics sunlight on shadows through grass and through plants and shrubs, and it helps camouflage the baby by breaking up its outline. Obviously they're named for their tail, 
And as you can see here, the hairs on that tail are a lot longer than the hairs on the rest of the coat. This deer is in its winter coat, that beautiful gray brown color. And the hairs on the tail uh, are in some cases over three inches long and they can flare them and the hair on their rump. And one nickname for a deer's white-tailed deer's tail is called a flag. And it will move its tail back and forth as a signal to other deer that there's something that is dangerous or frightening in the neighborhood. And other deer will see that, they'll start flagging their tails as well, and then they all go running off away from danger. So it's a great warning and signaling device. Now, when they wanna hide, they can curl that tail behind over their backside between their legs, and they can contract those muscles. And you, if a deer is trying to hide, you will swear it has no tail at all because you see very little to no white on its backside when its tail is, is clamped down and it's trying to hide. Male deer are called bucks and their claim to fame is growing this beautiful crown of antlers every year. So the antlers are made of bone and usually in about uh, mid to late April or early May uh, in our area here, they will start growing a new set of antlers. It takes a lot of resources and a lot of energy from, from the buck's body to grow a set of antlers. And if you look at these, they are unfinished, so they're still growing, and they almost look kind of fuzzy. That's because they grow from the outside in. There is a thin layer of skin called velvet, which covers the, the new bone growth underneath. And that skin is very rich in blood vessels. So that's what brings the minerals, the nutrients, the calcium to uh, the antlers to facilitate the growth. In the fall, when those antlers are complete, that those blood vessels will shrivel up and die and the skin starts to, to split and peel and come off. It gets very itchy for the buck and that's one reason they'll rub their antlers along trees is to help get rid of that velvet, oops. And that's what that crown looks like when it's completely finished. You can see it's shining, bare bone, all of that skin has been uh, worked off. You also see that our fall deer, the neck is very much swollen versus the summer deer there. And that's because this, this buck is in rut. It is in, in the breeding uh, cycle for deer. So the neck muscles swell up in the buck. Uh, they will use those antlers to spar with other males as territorial dispute. And they'll use them also to mark up trees as territorial markers and to attract does. And I love to include this. This was taken from one of our trail cameras simply because this is a uh, mother doe and her fawn. And this fawn is a perfect example of a young, healthy animal that is burning off energy just for the sake of it. So I love to show an animal just out there playing for the sake of play. And of course, it's burning off energy because it just cannot help moving around like children, our own, our own human kids, when they've got energy and get the fidgets, they've got to get it out of their feet. You know, they've got to move their feet around or jump or go and run and play. And young animals are the same way. And as they're running and jumping and twisting and turning, they're also building up their muscles and perfecting ways to uh, escape from potential predators. But I would just like to see them play. That's just fun. Mom's kind of looking around and but the baby could care less. It's just having fun. <laughs> I love showing that one. One of the other uh, animals that we can see is the Eastern Cottontail. And this is one of only two rabbit species that are found in Ohio. Ohio only has two. The Eastern Cottontail is found statewide, north to south, east to west in Ohio. The other species is the snowshoe hare, and it is confined only to the extreme northeastern forested part of the state. So the eastern cottontail is the only rabbit species we have uh, at Fernald, and we see it quite frequently. It's found, uh, you can find it along the edge of the trails or along the edge of the park roads, browsing on that wonderful, uh, on the grass, the clover. Again, it'll also eat some shrubby plants and berries when they're in season as well as tree bark in the winter if things get really tough for them. And of course, they're known for those big back feet. They're very uh, speedy and great at hopping. They're also built for taking in information. They have great eyesight. And again, those large ears that can pick up any sound, no matter how faint around them, hearing that's much better than ours. 
Again, they are herbivores, strictly greens, although they will eat a little fungus from time to time too. And I like to say that rabbits are good at math. I mean, the old joke is rabbits are multipliers. Well, in the case of the Eastern cottontail, it is absolutely true. Just to give you a problem, if you want something to, to work on, if you're, if you're uh, sitting at home and, and maybe you don't have a little uh, anything else to do for a few minutes, try this math problem on for size. One female Eastern cottontail can have up to five litters of babies each year. Each of those litters of babies can have up to seven babies. So think about how many offspring one pair of rabbits and their descendants could potentially produce in a year or two years or five years. That's a whole lot of rabbits. So in actuality, rabbits are pretty good at multiplying. They're also prey for a wide variety of animal species, not just mammals, but also uh, birds as well. And the young rabbits, uh, when they're very small, uh, are potential prey for um, reptiles such as uh, the black rat snake as well. So there are a lot of different animals that like to eat them as part of their diet. And uh, that is one reason their reproductive strategy is so numerous is because there's a lot of things that might wanna eat them. So the more babies that they can have in any given year, the more chances are that the species will carry on. And they are constantly on the move. Um, they do not have uh, a set burrow that they, that they um, live in. In fact, they don't live in burrows at all. They take shelter under brush piles uh, in thick vegetation and uh, around tree roots. And they will move from location to location and follow the, follow the food as the plants uh, ripen and they can find, uh, find food. You can find them in open habitats and fields, but in the wintertime, a lot of times they'll go back into the shelter of the edge of the forest for protection from the weather and also for winter food sources that they will have too. So they might have a set home range, but they don't have a set home that they go back to. And again, they are named for that fluffy tail that looks just like a white cotton ball. And you can see that the fur is that kind of grizzled gray brown, which blends in to a lot of the surrounding areas and get another good look at those ears. And I love putting this in here too, because this is behavior that I had heard about with Eastern cottontails, but I had never seen. And this video was just taken in early June of 2020. So just a couple of years ago, when cottontails are courting, the male and the female will face each other. The female will jump straight up in the air. The male will run underneath her. And then as the female comes down, she'll do a 180 in the air and land so that they're facing each other. And sometimes they'll even box each other with their front paws. So I was very excited to actually get a chance to see this behavior on our wildlife camera footage. So watch this. It almost looks like they're fighting, but we have a male and female that are courting their mating display. <laughs> I was so happy to see that. I'd heard about it for years and I've been uh, doing naturalist uh, work and teaching about nature and wildlife for the better part of 40 years. And it took me until 2020 in my career to actually see this behavior. So I am just thrilled to death to be able to see that. And again, just for a second or two, we have a uh, young rabbit here. This is a young adult rabbit and it is burning off energy just for the sake of doing it. It's not being chased by anything. It is just having a grand old time literally getting the fidgets out of those hind legs. But watch how fast this guy goes. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> Again, it is just burning off energy for the sake of burning energy. I love it. Coyotes are also have been found and seen and heard on site as well. And they have the distinction now of being the top predator species for Ohio. They have uh, migrated into the state. Actually, the first sighting of a coyote in Ohio, I believe, was in the early 1920s. So they've been here for a while. And the very nature of 
the changes that humans have made to the land in the eastern part of the United States, the felling of the, the forests, fragmenting of the habitat, creating more open spaces for homesteads and farms, building bridges and railway lines has enabled the coyote to expand its territory exponentially into the eastern part of the nation. Also, the fact that we removed larger carnivores like the eastern cougar and the gray wolf, both of which were historically found in Ohio, gave room for this medium-sized predator to kind of slip in and um, uh, become a dominant predator species in our area. Now, having said that, they are a member of the dog family. They are wild. And a lot of people think coyotes are bigger than they are. I didn't mention it when I was talking about the beaver, but they are the largest rodent species found in North America. They're the second largest rodent species in the world. And a beaver can potentially weigh in at 70 pounds. An average sized coyote in our area weighs in at about half that. 35 to 40 tops is about the size of a, a big coyote in our area. They just do not get larger than that. They're considered a medium-sized carnivore, and that's one reason, as well as their diet, that they've been able to live in close proximity to people so well. They're mo they are omnivorous. They're not strictly carnivorous like their larger cousins, the wolves, are. So they eat a little bit of everything. Now I'm going to stop and pause here for a moment because I want to get some input from a couple of people. If someone wants to chime in through chat, what they think the number one type of item on a coyote's diet list would be. What's the number one, the highest percentage item on that coyote menu? Anybody want to guess? <clears throat> Any takers? All right, this may surprise you. 40% of a coyote's diet is made up of small rodents. So Angela, you were seeing mice and voles, um, and someone said that they like their persimmon. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm glad someone said persimmon because again, mice, mice, rats, voles, that includes chipmunks and squirrels. Those are included in those small rodents, but almost half of a coyote's diet is made up of small rodents. And someone said persimmon, the next highest percentage of uh, material that they eat on the menu is plant material. Now we're also cheating a little bit and in including fungus in there as well. And also we're including insects in that. So 40% of small rodents, 25% is plants, insects, and fungi. 15% are cottontail rabbits. So they are they do prey on cottontails as well. 15% is white-tailed deer. Now, let me put a caveat on there. When they prey on white-tailed deer, coyote are far too small to uh, prey on and bring down an adult healthy white-tailed deer. What they do prey on are the fawns, especially in the first two weeks of life when they're, when they're being hidden by their, by their mother and they're a little too weak to follow mom around for those first 10 to 14 days of life. So coyotes will prey on the, on the young fawns. They will also scavenge on roadkill deer. And if they find a deer that is incapacitated due to illness or injury that cannot escape, then yes, it is possible for them to prey on an adult deer, but an adult healthy white-tailed deer is more than a match for a coyote. Unlike their bigger cousins too, they don't hunt in packs. They do not have coordinated uh, pack hunting strategy like wolves do. Um, what they will do is hunt as single animals or the resident male and female breeding pair in the family group will hunt together. Now they will live in family groups of about six to nine adults and the pups from the breeding pair of that year, only the dominant pair male and female in that family group will breed every year. The uh, other coyotes in that group will act as aunts and uncles to the pups and help raise them and help feed them, but they do not hunt together as a coordinated family unit. 
So um, five percent of that diet is made up of human sources. Now, that includes stuff like um, bird seed from feeders or suet from bird feeders. That includes pet food left out. Um, so that's a good reason to not feed your pets outside is it cuts down on coyotes and other animals coming in uh, to, to get food off your back porch. But also it includes garbage from time to time. But if you compare that 5% to 40%, which is small rodents, they're actually doing us a favor <laughs> by taking care of, of the small rodents in the area. So they, because they are omnivores and because they are smaller, they don't hunt in large coordinated packs, they are much better suited to living in closer proximity to people. And coyotes can be either part of a, that family group or they can be uh, solitary coyotes. You have, you have both types uh, that will live either as packs or as solo animals. All right, so I have here a, a little video clip of a coyote coming along one of the deer trails in, in, in the uh, forests at the northern boundary of Fernal Preserve. And this weird thing hanging down here is actually a turkey feather. <clears throat> one of the other naturalists hung this turkey feather up to try to entice one of the other animals I'm getting ready to talk about uh, into stopping in front of the trail camera and taking a look at it. Now, this trail is used by coyotes a lot. This is from November of 2020, but this is apparently the first time this coyote in the video clip is encountering this feather. And this gives you an idea of why we really don't see coyotes a lot of times on site. I've only seen a coyote in person once on the site, although we know we've got at least two family groups that share territory that overlaps in Fernald because they're very shy and very secretive. We find tracks, we find scat, we find fur when they're uh, scratching and getting rid of that winter coat. But this will show you how spooky they are about new things in their environment. So watch what happens when this coyote comes across and notices this strange feather thing hanging across the trail. Yeah! <laughs> and it'll come back in. What the heck was that? I don't know. And it goes on its merry way. <laughs> So they are hyper vigilant, absolutely, and attuned to anything that might be new or strange in their neighborhood. This is a rare shot of one during the day. This is a young female. And as you can see, they look really thin and rangy. This is uh, from late June of 2013. And this is just a young female coyote kind of hanging out, checking out things around her, her territory, doing a little smelling. And she just trots off into the brush, completely unconcerned. So you can see why people think they are bigger than what they are, because they are taller, more long-legged than a, a dog, a medium-sized dog of the same pound weight range, 35 to 40 pounds would be. So that is one reason that people think they, they weigh more than they actually do. They look kind of taller, especially when they have their short summer coat in. They almost look like they're wearing stilts because their legs are so long proportionately to their body. One animal we're super excited about having on site are bobcats. And for the past seven years, we've had at least one female choose a place at Fernald to den up and raise her kittens. And we know that from the videos that we get uh, off the wildlife cameras. So just like the white-tailed deer, uh, they were extirpated, eliminated from the state uh, back in the late 1800s. They slowly began to repopulate the state in the mid to latter part of the 20th century. And I believe the first documented sighting of one on the Fernald site was back in 2010. So they've been there for a while, but again, very solitary. And the only reason we knew about that is because we caught pictures of them on one of the trail cameras. In fact, one of the first times that I went to recreate at the Fernald Preserve site, I was there right before sunset. And if you've ever been to the site, you know that at sunset, they do close the gates and there's no access to the site at night. Well, my husband and I were there watching some of the ducks on the front pond and one of the security guards pulled up to us. And I thought he was going to, you know, remind us that we had to leave because it was almost sunset. So I greeted him and I said, hi, you know, I know it's, it's getting close to closing. We're getting ready to leave. And he leaped out of his car with this piece of paper in his hand and he started waving and he said, no, no, come and look at this. Come and look at this. So I walked over and he had a printout of a still photo from the wildlife camera of a bobcat. And 
you talk about a nature nerd moment. We were both hopping up and down in the parking lot, super excited. My husband was sitting in the car going, yep, that's just her. <laughs> so it was nice to have a nature, nature nerd bonding moment with the security guard there. He was so excited and I was glad to hear about it. And they've been documented on the site ever since. I find a lot of tracks. I've only seen one in person, like the coyote, and that was from about 200 yards away. I got to see one as it was slinking back through the tall grass. So they are solitary. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. And they are very uh, wary of people, which is exactly what they're supposed to be. They are true carnivores. They eat uh, mammals, they'll eat reptiles. Uh, if they can find crayfish or a fish on the, the bank that a fisherman maybe uh, has gotten, they will scavenge that, they'll scavenge roadkill, they'll hunt birds, they'll eat birds' eggs, ground nesting birds' eggs, but they are strictly carnivorous. And of course, uh, that spotted fur has been their downfall. They have uh, been hunted not only as a predator, because uh, people feared they might get into their livestock and take like the, their young lambs or, or kids uh, or chickens and other poultry, but also because of that beautiful spotted fur, they're considered a fur bearing animal. And like I said, we're very super happy to know that a female has, uh, at least one female every year has raised her kittens on site. And I promised you some video of that. Here we have uh, from December, a couple of days before Christmas, uh, a few years ago. We have one, two, and this little blur right here is three kittens, and mom is back here. So you'll get to see these three kittens who are almost completely grown. They'll stay with mom usually through the first winter, and then they'll disperse in the spring, but these kittens still have the round baby face, and when they come up to the camera, you'll notice their coats are a lot more spotted than mom's are. So take a look at this. They are so cute. So here comes the kitten, and whoa, we just discovered the camera. <laughs> and again, mom is back here. So this guy's kind of smelling. There comes one sibling. You can see that beautiful spotted coat. They, as they grow older, they lose that patterning and it kind of mellows out into a kind of grizzled brown gray. So he's looking back to make sure mom's okay. But just like us, bobcats like taking selfies. So <laughs> very cool to get to see them. And I love this one because this is behavior that we usually don't get to pick up on a trail camera. Normally when you see a trail camera footage, you get hours and hours and hours and hours of trees blowing in the wind or empty screens. We have a bobcat here. You'll see it come over here and sit down in the edge of the snow and notice that it is looking and listening in the grassy area right here. When you see the bobcat leap out of the picture to the left, immediately start watching where my cursor is right here, that little line in the snow. When it leaps out of the picture, watch back here because you'll see a little brown blur go whoosh, right across and almost immediately a bigger brown blur whoosh, right across. It is looking and listening for a cottontail rabbit and you'll see the moment that it, it finally pinpoints that rabbit, jumps off screen and then watch right here for the rabbit to come by and then for the bobcat. So it definitely hears something, but it can't quite figure out where it's at. It's just enough to keep it interested. So let's sit here and look and listen for a minute. See its ears moving around. Again, you're gonna be watching right here where my cursor is, that little line in the snow. As soon as it pops out of frame, watch that area right there. And usually this is what happens with trail camera footage. You'll get a little bit of action. Boom, he's gone. Watch that snowpack. There goes the rabbit. There goes the bobcat. We were so fortunate to see the behavior in action. Usually when they leap out of frame, they're gone. And you're left with thousands of hours of this. <laughs> so going through wildlife trail camera video can be very, very boring from time to time. You get about five minutes of excitement and hours of nothing but it was worth it in this case. That was just a treat to see. We also have opossums on the site, which of course is our only North American resident marsupial. 
and here's mom with babies. Once the babies are out of the pouch, they will hitch a ride with mom uh, up through the first fall. They'll gradually descend from her back uh, and start feeding on their own. And sometimes she just walks away and leaves them where they're at and they're perfectly capable of surviving on their own. And they are also omnivores. They eat a little bit of everything, including roadkill, which is why we see them along the roadsides a lot of times. Um, car mortality is a big problem for them. And again, they will hang with mom. So here, getting ready to come in frame is an opossum. With babies hitching a ride and she's got at least five, maybe six on her. Can you imagine having six kids and having to carry them around when they're uh, at least six or seven years old? <laughs> That's about the size, uh, size correlation right there. So these guys are plenty big enough to be on their own, but they'll hitch a ride as long as they possibly can. Raccoons, also a critter that we find on site, just like in most parts of Cincinnati. So what is it? They're not a cat, although they look kind of like it. They're not a dog, although they look kind of like it. They're actually in their own group of animals, their own genus, Procyon. And they're most closely related to, of all things, um, red pandas and giant pandas, which aren't really bears. They're also in that same, uh, same group of animals. Raccoons are obviously easily recognizable by that uh, black mask across their face and the rings on their tail. Their nickname is the ringtail bandit. And just like us, they have five toes on their uh, hind feet and five toes on their front paw. So a paw print from a front paw of a raccoon looks very similar to a human handprint. They have very sensitive skin on their uh, feet, especially their front feet. And they rely on that sense of touch to help them find food and to connect them to the world. They do have good, good senses of smell, hearing, and eyesight, but those pads on their front feet, especially with those nerve endings, are super sensitive. And maybe you've heard the uh, legend that they wash their food before they eat it. That's not true, but what they do is when those paw pads on their front paws are wet, that sensitization is increased and they do eat a wide variety of things. They will eat plant material as well as um, uh, hunt for food, but they will also eat aquatic animals like uh, shellfish, mussels, crayfish, uh, lizards, small snakes, things like that, salamanders. So they will hunt in the water and if it looks like they're staring into space and feeling around, they're actually using that sensitive skin on the surface of their front paws to help them find food and differentiate between a rock or sand and something that might be edible in the water. So they rely on that sense of touch very, very much. They will den up either in hollow trees or uh, other burrows and shelter areas that they find. And they're surprisingly social. Uh, a lot of people thought that raccoons were more solitary, but especially during the winter, several will den up together and share warmth. And of course the babies will stay with mom uh, through the first uh, fall season, if not through the first winter before they disperse on their own. Now, as to getting into places where they don't belong, raccoons are surprisingly nimble. This is a wire box that our echo crew have put out in an area off one of the trails. And when they find animals sometimes that have been hit by cars on the roadside, what they will do is put the animal in this and let nature decomposition take its course. And that's if they want to save, say the, say the skull or some of the bones for teaching purposes, they'll let insects and bacteria and small animals uh, you know, deconstruct that, that dead animal so that they can save the bones for, for using for teaching. So if it's a smaller animal, they will put it inside this box. And just to give you an idea of the size, each of these welded wire squares is about three inches square. So not very big at all. We have an animal that's inside here and you'll notice this raccoon stuck its head through and is pretty interested. So I was curious to see if it was gonna get stuck so I decided to include this just to show you how easily it is for a raccoon to get into very small spaces and look at it squeeze, especially that back end in there. I would think it would be stuck at this point, but nope. Checking some stuff out and not a problem. I'm in here and life is good. 
Now, I was a little worried when I saw this because I didn't know if it would make it out or not. So it's kind of checking some stuff out, seeing what's in here, seeing if there's anything it can carry off. Yeah, I don't know. Let me see. How can I get out of here? Now, you'll notice it's using its nose. What it does is it is smelling for the scent trail that it left coming in and boom, not a problem squeezing right back out. So you can see how easy it is to get under an eave or maybe a little crack in a door and get into an, a detached garage or possibly an attic or maybe a basement and take shelter. And uh, they are very well suited to living in close proximity to people too, as we all know. Uh, we found a chim uh, raccoon uh, mother that raised babies in our chimney stack a few years ago. And I found that out because I went in the basement and I heard squeaking coming from the exhaust uh, hood from our uh, hot water heater. And I was like, oh, darn it. So we waited for the babies to grow up. And then as soon as they were gone, we capped that chimney and we've not had a problem since. But they, will, they are adept at getting into areas where they should not be in. Just to finish up very quickly, we have over 250 species of birds that have been sighted on site. Lots of reptiles and amphibians. Uh, great horned owl here is one of them. We have seen bald eagles on the site. We have a lot of migratory waterfowl and other birds that come in for the winter and songbirds that come in for the summer and then uh, depart when the weather gets cold again. So it is a magnificent place for looking for wildlife of all kinds. And I encourage everybody to come out. Feel free to check out our website. Um, I'll be happy to provide that information to Lynn and she can disperse it to everyone. There's more information on uh, virtual programs and uh, uh, the site history as well on offer. And at that point, I will end it right there and open the floor up for a few questions real quick. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Angela. That was awesome. Yeah. So if anyone's got questions, you can either type them in chat or unmute yourself and ask them out loud. I know I've got my husband hooked on going there because of the beavers. He keeps going down with his camera trying to spot them in action. So we've seen them a few times out active. Um, if anyone is into birds, um, you'll quite often see on the eBird alert, I get a daily mm -hmm. update for Butler County and for Hamilton County. And quite often, like the birds people are going nuts for are ones that are down at Fernald. So like today for Hamilton County, my eBird alert was telling me there's um, rough, -led, rough legged hawks. But nice. a lot of the, yeah, and a lot of the animals that Angela mentioned are things that we are seeing and we're getting calls from people in our office um so yeah the bobcats were first seen down at fernald <clears throat> but we're hearing from people in riley township and stuff that they've been catching them on their ring cameras or whatever else um or some of the the farmers we work out there have got wildlife cameras up have been spotting them as well angela i had a question on your trail cams um yes where uh like those look like they are ground level. Do you, how do you affix those so that they don't get gone? Or are they just out, not on trails where people don't see them? They are absolutely not on trails that are open to the public. And okay. for that specific reason, we, um, before I got there way, way back, uh, a couple of cameras were placed prominently along the trails and those walked away with other visitors. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they get attached to trees now with heavy duty cables and, and very strong locks. Mm -hmm. um, we have placed cameras on top of the grassy cap on the on-site disposal facility, especially this time of year, because one of the seasonal migrants we get in are short-eared owls coming down from Canada because mm -hmm. uh, we are their equivalent of Miami Beach, if you can believe Ohio being warmer than Canada. Surprisingly, it is still so. Uh, and there's no perching areas above the grass level on top of the on-site disposal facility. So we, we built a little wood block mount and weighted it down with rocks, strapped the camera to it. And this year we got 15 hours of a short-eared owl's tail covering the lens where it was perching on top of the camera. Oh. <laughs> 
And then we got two very brief shots of one sitting in front of the camera before it flew away to go hunt. But we know they're up there because they use our camera to perch on. <laughs> there you go. Yes, trail cam footage can be uh, quite boring. <laughs> It can be very exciting or extremely frustrating. <laughs> but, that's one, but that's one thirty seconds. Awesome. Thank you. Exactly. So Jeff was asking about the visitor center. Yes. Now the site itself is open to the public uh, dawn to dusk year round, even now. So the seven miles of hiking trails are open for walking and wildlife uh, observation. We are looking forward later on in the year to the visitor center reopening, but it is still closed at this at this point in time. As soon as we find out that we are going to be able to reopen and start doing programs in person, if you are on our mailing list, we will send word out through there first. And what I'm going to go ahead and do right now is put our Fernald email address up there. Someone can send us an email. And we will and say put us on the email list. We'll be happy to do that. Right now, we send out once a month um, a listing of all the virtual public programs that we are going to offer to the next month. And as soon as we get information on reopening the visitor center, like I said, we will trumpet it through that email list first. So I will go ahead and send that. There we go. It's fernald at lm.doe.gov. And that's for more information on the site or to learn, uh, receive our monthly program email that we send out. And that's literally all you'll get from us. We tend to leave you alone unless you've got really big news. <laughs> Are there any more questions for Angela? Okay, if not, then... Um... Kathy from the Hamilton Conservation Corps is going to get herself set up to share um, the planning for wildlife gardening. So Great. Very quickly, I'll say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much for letting me come on and talk to you tonight. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate the chance to teach, and it was great to interact with everybody. So I hope you all have a very good evening. Thank Thanks, you. Angela. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay, everybody, I'm going to get my, uh, my screen shared here. Is it there? Yes. All right. Oh, look, look. All right. Awesome. Hang on. I want to turn off my camera. That didn't work at all, did it? Do I have to stop my share to do that? Hmm. There I am. Do that again. All right. You ready for me to go, Lynn? Yes. Sorry, I was okay. on mute. No, that's okay. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Schwebel. I'm with the Hamilton Conservation Corps. Uh, we are a group of volunteers who take care of uh, an area called the Riverside Natural Area that is down by the river, hence the name Riverside Natural Area. It is between the ponds that are near Miami Hamilton and Joyce Park. It's about 200 acres in there. Uh, my husband and I started offering to mow the trails one year and, um, and here we are. We also have a nature center that if anyone is familiar with the old Hamilton area um, was uh, the old Joe Nuxall driving range. And we do uh, uh, programs there. Lynn uh, um, helped host our conservation kids program that was there last summer and we'll be doing that again. Um, our passion is promoting native wildlife and native plants. Um, and tonight we're gonna to talk about planting your garden uh, and the emphasis really will be on native plants. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box and uh, Lynn or JT can jump in and ask them as we go. All right, so we're gonna talk about planting your garden first and um, what, what you need to do is know what you have before you start adding more things. At least that's where we're going with this. 
Uh, so the first thing you want to do is you want to outline your property boundaries. Exactly how much property are you talking about? Do you have a small backyard uh, in, in a neighborhood or do you have 10 acres? Uh, if you have 10 acres, I'm really jealous. Uh, you want to sketch your footprint of anything that is permanent on your on your on your map for your garden. That would be your house, your patio, your driveway, uh, swimming pool, uh, anything that is going to stay where it is, and you can't move it to plant more plants. You want to graph your tree canopies, uh, including your your neighbors. Um, because if your neighbor has two or three oak trees, uh, but there aren't any cherry trees or there aren't any willows or there aren't any sycamores, then for you to plant more oak trees is kind of redundant. So figure out what your, what your neighbors have as well, and you will be able to um, add some, some diversity to the environment. Uh, mark your locations uh, that are taken up by trees or I have got a, hang on, I've got a, um, all right, sketch other plants, including vines, perennials, brambles, ornamental grasses. Brambles are um, something that we are missing uh, critically in our environment now. Lots of, of wildlife like brambles, things like hazelnut and witch hazel and uh, the underlying, the understory bushes, uh, spice bush and viburnum. That provides a lot of shelter uh, for the, for, for wildlife. And we just don't have a lot of that even out in, even out in, in the native areas anymore. Um, designate any other landscape elements that you have, uh, like trellises or fences, sculptures, fountains, once again, things that you're not going to move. Uh, water features are a very important uh, item for you to, to take note of. Um, the three things that, that, that native, uh, native animals need are shelter and water and food. Um, so make sure that we are providing for all of that. Identify locations of your utilities, uh, overhead and underground before you dig. Uh, we ourselves had a, a, a mishap with that uh, at some property that we own. Uh, we have an old uh, house that uh, is, uh, was built in 1863. And whenever we bought the property, we had two acres and about an acre and a half of it was honeysuckle. So we just started ripping it all out. And uh, our favorite way to rip it out was to just put a chain around it and pull it out with the truck. And one day um, the gas company came by and was looking at the gas line and it was about four inches under the ground right where we had been uh, pulling honeysuckle out. So always check and see where your utilities are before you dig, before you yank things out, before you start just cutting branches down. Uh, it will save you a lot of headache in the future. Determine any rights of way that adjoin your property. Uh, you do not want to put a lot of money into planting a bunch of plants just to find out that it's not your property and that somebody is gonna take them out. Analyze what you have already. Um, there are 20 questions. I gave uh, that to Lynn and she posted it on the website. You guys are more than welcome to uh, download that and, and look at your garden. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to do a brief overview of those 20 questions. So oak trees are what we call a keystone plant, and they provide more food for insects than any other plant in this area. So you really want to look and see, do we have oaks? If there are no oaks around your property, think about where you can put one. Uh, not all oaks are huge. Some of them uh, are smaller. Not all oaks take 900 years to grow. Uh, so do some research into that. And uh, if you don't have an oak tree anywhere around, plant one. Look at all your other deciduous trees. Our top, uh, we'll talk about this later, our top three trees in this area for providing food 
for insects and for birds are oak trees, cherry trees, and willows. So those are, if you look around and see if you have any of those three. If you have none of them, give some serious thought as to adding one of those. Uh, look at all of your trees, uh, evergreens, and see what does it actually provide for the wildlife? Does it provide shelter? Does it provide food? Does it provide um, seeds or berries? Does it provide nectar or pollen? And um, if you are missing things in the tree category that, go, that, that would provide those things, see if you can find something to plant in there for that. You're gonna do that with your whole entire garden. You're gonna look at your shrubs, ask the exact same questions. You're gonna look at your annuals and your perennials and your vines. Do they provide what, what shelter, what food it, um, and what resources they provide? Um, we have what we call, we had a yes question. sir. What All right. Good, what is a good smaller native tree or shrub for the south side of a house? Mostly all day sun, I was thinking dogwood or prunus. Correct, uh, dogwood is gonna be the smaller uh, of that, of, of those two or a wild or a black cherry. Um, black cherries can get relatively tall. Your dogwoods are gonna stay smaller. The nice thing is that they, they, provide, um, they provide shelter. They provide nectar and pollen in the, in the spring with their flowers and they will provide um, food with their seeds in the fall. Um, I was also going to add um, spice bush to that. Yes. For a shrub, Lindera benzoin. There's a native spice bush, and then I think there's an Asian mm -hmm. one. So you want to try and go make sure you're going with a native one um, for swallowtail, butterflies, and so on. Correct. For spice bush, swallowtails. Um, the, the spice bush is, an, is a wonderful substitute for forsythia. Blooms about the same time, has that beautiful, uh, has those beautiful yellow flowers. Uh, and in the fall, their foliage can be really pretty too. But that is the, that is the host plant for, um, for the spice bush swallowtails. More questions? Any other questions? Not so far. Okay, all right. So we have the dirty dozen-ish, which are invasive plants that if you have them on your property, my heart and soul says you need to remove them as soon as possible. The first one being the Bradford or Calorie Pear. Um, they will actually be illegal to be sold in the state of Ohio in January of 2013. They have escaped their their their, their habitat where we planted them in neighborhoods and subdivisions. And if anyone has driven out the interstate, particularly out 129 and gotten off at 75 in the spring, whenever they are in bloom, it, it is just frightening. They grow so tightly uh, next to each other that they block out all sunlight and there's nothing grows under them. So if you have one of those, get rid of it. Uh, did I miss mine, the rest of them? Hang on, there we go. Two, an invasive princess tree. Uh, I, I know that they are around. I have not seen any. Uh, they are both, they're also very invasive. Tree of heaven or Alanthus. I just heard uh, uh, a workshop the other day that it, they can have like a half a million seeds from one tree per season. And there are male trees and there are female trees. The female trees, and JT, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, the female trees are the ones who have the blooms and they have all the seed pods. Uh, if you have a, a, a lot of property and you're trying to get rid of trees of heaven that are invasive, you only have so much time and you only have so much energy. So try to find the females and cut them down first. Uh, they are also one of those plants that whenever you cut it down, there's gonna be a bazillion uh, offshoots from it. So you need to treat those stumps as quickly as possible after you have cut those down. Invasive bamboo, uh, 
needs to go. You also need to take, you can't just cut it down. It also needs to have roots ripped out or it needs to be uh, chemically treated as soon as possible. Uh, heavenly bamboo, same thing. Privets, uh, those are bushes that are very invasive. Autumn olive, we have a, a nice stand of that over at the natural area. You'll know that because it has that um, in the fall, it has that shimmery, silvery kind of uh, color to it. Burning bush, if you have a burning bush uh, and you keep it trimmed, it's not as bad as if you let it go to seed every year because what happens is the birds love to eat those little berries and then they go and drop them whenever they, whenever they poop and we have burning bush everywhere. Uh, a very good substitute for that is native burning bush. It's also called Eastern Wahoo or Euonymus. Do not uh, confuse that with the Euonymus winter creeper, which is a very invasive uh, vine that you don't want. Honeysuckle, which is the bane of my existence. Uh, we have spent many hours uh, ripping that out. Uh, it really was very unsightly whenever I bought private property and had to rip a more sunny honeysuckle out as well. Uh, once again, if whenever you cut that down, you need to treat it as soon as possible with some sort of chemical because it will just re-sprout very quickly. Japanese honeysuckle, and then the winter creeper or the creeping euonymus. Uh, the creeping euonymus, it will, in, it will encircle trees and actually completely choke them out and kill them. Uh, so trying to get rid of that is, is very important. Whenever you, whenever you go through your list and you write those down, those 11 things, you need to put a big red X next to and get rid of them. Uh, so what's next? Look at your map and inventory and decide what's missing. Review those 20 questions. Um, do you need bug sources? Do you need trees? Do you need understory? Uh, one of the reasons you want to plant understories and, and and things under your trees is that uh, there are insects, caterpillars, they, they, lay their, they lay their eggs on the leaves of the trees, the, the, the eggs hatch, the caterpillars eat the leaves, and then they've got to, they, lots of times they will drop down onto the ground, burrow in, and that's where they, they lay more eggs and they become larvae. So, um, the best way to provide sources for those is to have multi-layered um, landscaping. So have your understories, your perennials, um, some great understory uh, ground covers is wild ginger. Um, we have, um, I can see it, coral bell, hookahs, uh, lots of ferns, right? Uh, look again and see what kind of food sources are they, do you have food sources for all four seasons? And birds still need shelter in the winter. What to plant? Determine the orientation of your garden. Where are your shady areas? Where are your sunny areas? Determine your soil type. I believe, Lynn, am I correct that you could, that they will, they can tell you what kind of soil you have and that we have in this area as far as like clay or, or loam? We um, have a lot of um, silty loams in this area. You mm -hmm. can speak to JT about mm -hmm. doing a soil test through um, Ohio State Extension, or you can get online to look at the web soil survey. And we have information on our website about how to do the web soil survey to get an idea of the soils that you have on your property. It's not the same as doing a soil test. Soil test okay. is much more accurate for telling you your soil's needs when it comes to N, P, and K. Um, but yeah. Is, um, is there a charge for that soil test that they do with OSU Extension? Yes. JT, can you remember how much it is these days? Just a little over $20. Uh, it's a garden soil test. It goes to Michigan State University. Uh, you would send your payment there and they would send your results back. You can access okay. the soil test on our website, butler.osu.edu, under Agriculture and Natural Resources tab, and you'll see soil testing. 
and you can download all the documents there, FAQs, there's a video how to, um, and if you have follow-up questions, just let us know. And also, I wanted to point out, I did put info about the Tree of Heaven um, in the chat about the male and female differences. Oh, good. Thank you. And if you go to the soil tab on the Butler SWCD website, it has information about the web soil survey. Um, and it also tells you how you can test your soil texture by basically feeling it, getting your hands really muddy. And then there's another thing on there about testing your soil's percolation, which is how easily the water can drain through it. So okay. There's a, video, there's a few videos on there. Awesome. So it's a lot of do-it-yourself stuff as well. Yeah. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, decide what you want your garden to look like. Do you want it to be formal? Do you want it to be casual? Um, what is it that you want people to see from the street? Yeah, do you wanna work on your front yard first? Do you wanna work on your backyard first? Do you want a water feature? Uh, and um, what do you want to see whenever you look out your windows? Uh, I know that in the new house, um, I have a kitchen window and I'm gonna be very specific with what I plant outside of that window. I want my bird feeders out there. I want bushes out there with, um, with berries where I can see the, the birds come and eat the berries, All right? Um, now that you've got your map, uh, it's time to make some decisions. So what is it you're gonna plant, All right? Uh, which spaces are for people? Sketch out those spaces on your map. Uh, where can you add vegetation? So um, the most important thing that you wanna do is add as many plants as you can to support native wildlife. Uh, so if you've got vast areas of grass, um, try to get rid of that. I don't know how many of you have read the Doug Tallamy books, but uh, we, um, if we can get half of the yards in the United States that are all grass replaced with native vegetation, we are gonna make a huge impact on, on, our, on our native species, all right? Um, are there any unique things that you really want or that you need? If you've always wanted a fountain, now could be the time to put that in. Uh, if you've always wanted an arbor with beautiful vines on it, now's the time to look for that. All right, five-step plan. You wanna choose your tree or trees. We talked about that whenever you look at your 20 questions. Uh, what trees can you add? You, there are, uh, there is, I, in fact, I added it on our resources. You can go to National Wildlife Federation and um, look for your native plants and it will tell you which ones uh, are, are native to this area, tell you how many different insects that it, that it um, supports and also give you ideas of how big they get, how fast they grow, okay? Um, look for understory trees. Uh, dogwoods, red buds, pawpaws, corn beans, uh, service berries, uh, choose your shrubs. Uh, blueberries is another one of those that you'll find that supports a lot of insect life and they have wonderful little blueberries. Hazelnuts, I just learned that the hazelnut bush is uh, threatened if not endangered in the state of Ohio. Those are on the, uh, the Warren County and Butler County soil and water uh, tree sale um, website this year. So hazelnuts, airwood viburnums, witch hazel is another phenomenal uh, bush. Anybody who's seen that blooming, it blooms basically in the winter, has this beautiful yellow blooms on it. Uh, winter berry, um, uh, always look for some sort of evergreen that's gonna support some cedar wax wings. Um, choose perennials, uh, rutabecchia, uh, butterfly weed, not butterfly bush, but butterfly weed, Solomon seal, asters, bee balm. Um, look for may apples, uh, ginger, hookera, Virginia creeper. Native honeysuckle vine is uh, amazing for hummingbirds. Now from, I've been checking into this and uh, trumpet vine, seems to be more aggressive than the native honeysuckle vine. 
So that's probably what I'm going to go with, but uh, it's great for, um, for hummingbirds. Lobelia columbines, also hummingbirds love, uh, and don't forget some ferns. Native grasses are amazing. Uh, they, uh, they give you winter texture. They also normally have some really good seeds that the, that the birds love. Um, some of the shorter varieties, you need to be careful because some of those native grasses get to be six feet tall. And I don't know how many of you have room for six foot tall grasses in your yard. I really don't. Uh, so some of the shorter varieties are little blue stem, a side oats, gamma grass, or prairie drop seed. Uh, they all have beautiful seed heads and, uh, and they have beautiful fall and winter color as well. Whenever you're gonna plant, don't plant just one plant of each thing, plant several. Uh, the, the wildlife will see a, a group of plantings faster than they will see a single species. Add water. Uh, bird baths need sloping sides for varying depths. Uh, moving uh, water avoids mosquitoes. You can get those little fountains that go that are even solar um, that have that are, are inter, that are run by solar energy that will keep the water moving in your in your bird baths so that you don't get mosquitoes. The bubblers are really popular right now, and apparently those attract hummingbirds as well. Bird baths or water features should be um, should be at least twenty feet from from the water uh, from the uh, uh, tree source because birds need to be able to find shelter. Uh, that's the perfect place for for predators to catch uh, birds is is on the bird feeders or the bird baths. Right. Um, the next the next thing you want to do is start planning and start buying. Uh, I gave um, uh, Lynn also a document for uh, plant resources and uh, that most of their dates are out. The Cincinnati Zoo, they have native plant sales at Boyer Farm. All of their dates are out. Cincinnati Nature Center, uh, I tried to call even today and couldn't get anything as far as dates. Um, Ohio Prairie Nursery and Ohio um, Prairie Nursery and Prairie Moon Nursery are also great uh, uh, mail order places to get stuff. Beans Native Plant Nursery is a lovely lady uh, who does all, um, all natives. She has woodies and um, her, her plant sales are listed on her Facebook page. Um, any questions, uh, suggestions? What else do we have on, on, on questions? Nothing. See anything else. Okay, all right. Um, JT is, are the Master Gardeners having a sale this year? Yes, they are. Uh, it is on the first Saturday of May. Let me pull that up. I can't remember the date. I'm not sure if it's the fifth or sixth here. While you're looking that up, Connie has raised her hand on her phone. So I don't know if she has a question, if she wants to unmute herself. Can you get that? Oh, there we go. How large? Oh, hold on. I got you open up chat again. Um, how large are minimum for Prairie Garden? Connie, do you mean like order? How large of an order? I think size of garden recommended. No, this is Con this is Connie. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, right. Is there a, a minimum? Like I, we just live in a suburb. Is there a minimum the garden should be to be beneficial to the wildlife? Absolutely not. You can do your gardening on a patio with your condo. Uh, any, any native plants are beneficial to, to nature, to the birds, to the insects. Um, I think the most important thing is that you is that you choose your is that you choose native plants. Okay. So no, um, just watch the sizes. Like I mentioned with the grasses, some of them can get very tall and very big. Um, 
whenever you're looking at these different species, um, some liatris will get four to five feet tall, some liatris will get two feet tall. Um, some milkweed, so the butterfly weed that I talked about is a milkweed, has beautiful, beautiful orange uh, blooms, and it stays about two feet tall, two feet wide, as opposed to the common milkweed that can get four to six feet tall. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Yeah, Thank viburnums you. are the same way. Viburnums can get very large. There are some smaller species. The other thing is, is that um, they told me at Boyer Farm that even some of the taller species like uh, like the, the Joe Pie weed and stuff, if you have, if you don't want them to get to be there six or eight feet tall or four to six feet tall, whenever they're about three feet tall or however tall you want them to be, if you top them before their seed, before their buds um, set, that they will, if, it, if it's time for them to bloom, instead of putting their energy back into growing to be six feet tall, they will put that energy into their blooms at bloom time and they will bloom at a shorter, uh, stature than they would if you let them grow all the way tall. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Kathy, there's a question. Um, good annuals is the question. Good annuals. Um, zinnias come to the top, are the first thing that I think of. Uh, oh my gosh, the birds love them. The, the hummingbirds love them. Uh, butterflies love them. Um, and you and Lynn can chime in on some of these as well. Um, salvia, we get a black, it's called black and blue salvia, gets about three feet tall and the number of bees that are on it are amazing. Um, petunias are good, uh, the butterflies like them. Um, I was actually really surprised, um, I love garden mums but had never really seen a lot of insect life on them. And I had garden mums out by the front this, this fall and they, were, they had several monarchs on them at the end of the year, um, nectaring on them. So, I, so even garden mums will draw them. Um, Lantana, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Lantana. Uh, that's great for that's great for um, uh, pollinators as well. You can't skip um, sunflowers for the finches. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the finches love the sunflowers. Sunflower is actually one of the uh, is one of the top um, perennials. Native sunflowers are is one of the top perennials. Also, that that the that uh, pollinators and uh, insects love. Um, but yeah, the non-native ones, they absolutely, yeah, the finches love those. Uh, asters are, are great. Um, and once again, you can, you look at all those different species. Some of them get to be two feet tall. Some of them get to be six feet tall. So whenever you're buying those, just check into what's, you know, what it is that you want for your yard. Um, the smaller areas just get the, the, the smaller plants, the shorter plants. Are hydrangeas native? No. No, they are not. There, there is a high, um, poppy mallows, I believe are in the hydrangea family and they are native, but, but like the oak leaf hydrangeas, limelight hydrangeas, they are not native. It's one of the things that we have not managed to kill from the, um, the tree sale that um, Butler and Warren County partner farm. <laughs> I've tried to get it kicked out of the sale for years. And, Is that PG hydrangea? Yeah, and there's just somebody in the Warren office that has a love for them, so they're still in there. Yeah, no, they are, they are not native. Okay, and, and perfect, to be perfectly honest, um, the hydrangeas that I have seen, I really have not seen a lot of wildlife on. I don't see a lot of pollinators. I don't see a lot of butterflies, bees, wasps, flies uh, on them. Oh, here's a good question. Okay. Where can we get native carnivorous plants? I have no idea. I'm not a carnivorous plant girl. Um, um, <laughs> I did speak to somebody one time. There's a place in Maryland 
Uh, so it's making sure if you ordered from them, of course, it's all online unless you want to go on a field trip. Um, but making sure if you are doing it to get ones that are native to this area. But the one, most of the ones we have in Ohio, you're going to find living in cedar bog. And yeah. trying to replicate that in your yard <laughs> would be a tough yeah. one. Um, yeah, carnivorous plants of Ohio and fens and bogs. Yeah, there's um, there is a carnivorous plant society, but last I saw their website wasn't linked anymore, and I don't do Facebook. So it does look like it does look like there is a carnivor Ohio carnivorous plant society, and it is on Facebook. Okay, yeah, I don't do Facebook, whoever, so I couldn't yeah, check. Whoever, yeah, whoever asked that question, look for them on uh, on Facebook. Quantity of decide what is a workable quantity of of area that you are willing to take care of, and my thoughts is try to get it back to where you want it to be. So if you can do five acres with, and, and also you will do it in stages. So the first year you're gonna remove as many invasives as you can. The second year, you're gonna go back and fight those same inv invasives um, for the ones who have, who, have strung back, who have sprung back up. Could just continue to fight those invasives. And once you get into that second or third year, you can start replacing some of those with understories get you some dogwoods in there, get some red buds in there, start getting some, some bush, um, some shrub type things in there, spice bush, viburnum, uh, the hazelnuts, so that there's less room for those invasives to come back. Once you get to that point and you're fighting less invasives in that area and doing more planting, move on to your next five or 10 acres, start re removing that, um, those, those invasives in there and just keep going and pretty soon you'll look behind you and there'll be more behind you that you've taken care of than there is ahead of you that you still need to fix. I hope that helps. Kathy, uh, they wanna know how to join uh, the organization that you're oh. in. Um, so you can, we actually have a Facebook page as well. It's called Hamilton Conservation Corps. Uh, if you are on if you are on Facebook, you can reach out to, uh, through that and we will get with you. Um, I don't have anyone's email addresses that are signed up for this, uh, but if Lynn or JT would want to send out our contact information, um, you can do that and they can do that and then you can just reach out to us. We have lots of opportunities for um, uh, invasive removal. We have, um, we have the, um, the greenhouse that we're starting to grow uh, native plants in. Uh, I've been doing a lot, a lot of the winter sowing uh, in the milk jugs. So we're gonna have a lot of stuff to be repotted here coming up pretty soon in the spring. If you registered, um, which you did not have to do, the registration was just so I could send a reminder email out, um, then I have your contact information. If not, I don't. Um, but yet, Kathy, are you done? showing your presentation i am do you want do you, you want, want to quit screen sharing then we can have little happy family faces and square dots my laptop hang broke. on i'm trying to stop the share yes yeah. oh laptop stop laptop share there, there we go back. all right hey, kathy do you mind yes, if sir. i post your email in the chat box no go right ahead okay so that way they can happening? contact you Perfect timing. I got a text from my husband. We've got a beastie. He's learning some Scottish between the bedroom and the kitchen ceiling. See you when you get home. So we have a problem with problem wildlife tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and that is actually going to be the topic of the next. That's going to be the main topic of the next session, which is in um, in May. Sorry, I'm having hey, to open yeah. all sorts of stuff up because my um, my laptop died partway through this. Oh. <laughs> which is very helpful. Um, but the next session is on May 2nd and Denise Ellsworth will be talking about nuisance wildlife and that'll be the main focus. And then I'll do a short session on how to um, attract dragonflies to your garden. We've got August 1st when Kathy will be speaking again and so will her husband, Troy. Um, between them, they'll be talking about landscape and light pollution. 
and then meet the bats, moths, and other nocturnal wildlife. And then November 7th, our water resource person is going to talk about drainage for people with good drainage issues, but also how to incorporate water features to attract wildlife. And then JP from Extension will talk about amphibians of Ohio. So hey, if Lynn. you want reminders, do the remind um, sign up on our homepage for the reminders. Hey Lynn, it's Marnie Tich uh, Tichanel from OSU, not Denise. Oh, yeah, I keep saying Denise instead of Mar. Yeah, sorry. Marnie. Hey, she yep. here. She didn't hear me, hear me say the wrong person. No okay, we don't have any other questions. I think I'm done. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. And, thank um, you. Yeah. Um, let us know if you have any questions in future. You can track JP or myself down, and now you've got Kathy's email as well. And yeah, we hope to see you for the the next few programs. We're hoping May, August, and November will be in, in person. Um, again, if something weird happens and we have to end up going um, virtual, if you register, I can email and let you um, let you know about that. If you don't register, then hopefully you'll hear somehow else. We do share through Facebook, and I know that um, Ohio State Extension is sharing through their Facebook as well. Um, but yeah, well, I really awesome. appreciate everyone being on here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.